Welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History. I'm Claire Ridgway. I research and write about Tudor history on a daily basis. I've published several books uh, on the subject um, and I'm here to bring you your Tudor fix today. Now, on this day in Tudor history, the 1st of July, 1543, so in the reign of King Henry VIII, very late in the reign of King Henry VIII, the Treaties of Greenwich were signed. Now, you're thinking, why do I want to know about treaties? Well, trust me, you do want to know about these treaties because these were important. These treaties were peace treaties between the kingdoms of England and Scotland. And they were concluded on this day by William Earl of Glencairn, Sir George Douglas, Sir William Hamilton, Sir James Learmonth, and Mr. Henry Val Navis, who were commissioners of the seven month old Mary, Queen of Scots, by the assent of James Hamilton, second Earl of Arran, who was acting as her regent. And King Henry VIII's uh, commissioners. Lord Thomas Audley, Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester, Thomas Thirlby, Bishop of Westminster, William Paulet, Lord St. John, and Sir John Gage. So those were all the commissioners on the sides of Mary Queen of Scots, who was just a baby at the time, and King Henry VIII. And they were all involved in agreeing to these treaties. Well, the first part of the treaties uh, was concerned with peace between the two countries. For example, promising that there would be peace during the life of either the prince and for one year after, and that neither prince shall make or procure war upon the other or his confederates or do anything to hurt of the other. The treaties also included a marriage agreement. Now, this is where it gets rather interesting. For this marriage agreement was concerning uh, the future King Edward VI, who was, of course, Prince Edward at the time, and Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, you might not have known that Edward VI was ever meant to marry Mary, Queen of Scots, so that's where it gets a little bit interesting. I'm going to share with you the terms for this part of the treaties, the marriage agreement. Uh, number one, that Prince Edward, eldest son and heir apparent of Henry VIII, now in his sixth year, shall marry Mary, Queen of Scotland, now in her first year. Two, upon the consummation of the marriage, if the king is still alive, he shall assign to the said Mary as dower lands in England to the annual value of £2,000 to be increased upon his death to £4,000. So there they're talking about uh, King Henry VIII still being alive and that uh, if he's still alive when Edward marries Mary then that shall be the financial agreement. Number three, until by force of this treaty the said Mary is brought into England she shall remain in custody of the barons appointed thereto by the three estates of Scotland and yet for her better education and care the king may send at his expense an English nobleman or gentleman with his wife or other lady or ladies and their attendants not exceeding 20 in all to reside with her. So they don't want Mary being sent to England but they're quite happy for King Henry VIII to uh, send uh, you know, her a tutor and you know a household uh, to help with her, uh, her bringing up and her education. Number four, within a month after she completes her 10th year, she shall be delivered to commissioners of England at the bounds of Berwick, provided that before her departure from Scotland, the contract of marriage has been duly made by proxy. So those are the arrangements for Mary to travel to England when she completes her 10th year. Five, Within two months after the date of this treaty shall be delivered into, into England six noblemen of Scotland, two of whom at the least shall be earls or next heirs of earls, and the rest barons or their next heirs, as hostages 
for the observance on the part of Scotland of these three conditions, viz. the first and fourth articles of this treaty, and the condition that any, if any of these hostages die, he shall be replaced within two months by another of equal quality. Scotland, however, is to have power to change the hostages every six months for others of equal quality. So this treaty is, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be formalised by uh, hostages uh, being taken to make sure that the terms of the treaty are stuck to. Number six, Scotland shall continue to be called the Kingdom of Scotland and to retain its ancient laws and liberties. Number seven, if after the marriage the prince should die without issue, the said princess shall be at liberty to return into Scotland unmarried and free of impediment. Eight, upon her going into England, James Earl of Arran, governor of Scotland, he was the man who was being regent, who meanwhile shall receive the fruits of that realm, shall receive an acquittance thereof from the king and Prince Edward, a convenient portion for her honourable entry into England reserved. Nine, this treaty to be ratified within two months. Although the treaties were ratified within two months, being ratified by the Earl of Arran on the 25th of August 1543, in December 1543, the Scottish Parliament actually went on to reject the treaties. So although they were ratified within the two-month period stated in the agreements, the Scottish Parliament then changed its mind. Now, this rejection of the treaties uh, led to a war between England and Scotland. And this war, I, I love the name of it. It is known as the Rough Wooing uh, because of the fact that it was to do with uh, this marriage alliance between Prince Edward and Mary, Queen of Scots. The war began in December 1543 and it actually went on into Edward VI's reign with Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector, continuing King Henry VIII's policy of a forcible alliance with the Scots. The war of rough wooing had two main aims. One, to force the marriage of Edward and Mary to make Scotland uh, you know, go back to the treaties to actually stand by what was agreed in Henry VIII's reign. And two, to weaken Scotland, Scotland being the traditional ally of France. Now, the main events of the rough wooing, as it was called, this war between England and Scotland, the main events were the burning of Edinburgh in May 1544 by the English fleet, the Battle of Ancrum Moor in February 1545, where the English forces were defeated by the Scots. Um, I actually have done a talk on that, so I'll give you a link to my talk on the Battle of Ancrum Moor. The Battle of Pinky Clough in September 1547, where the Scots were defeated by the English, and that battle is regarded as the last pitched battle between England and Scotland. The Siege of Haddington by the English, which started on the 23rd of August 1548, but the English forces eventually uh, had to withdraw in September 1549. Then this war, this rough wooing, was brought to an end finally by the Treaty of Boulogne in March 1550. That, of course, being in King Edward VI reign still. Of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, and Edward never did marry. Uh, it, that alliance just fell apart. Of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, ended up going to France and marrying uh, the Dauphin of France, who became King uh, Francis II of France. And of course, Edward uh, never did marry. Uh, he died uh, young before uh, he had chance to marry. 
So I just wanted to share with you the terms of those treaties because I don't think that many people know that uh, Edward and Mary were meant to marry and not many people either know about the resulting war between England and Scotland that uh, happened because Scotland uh, didn't, uh, didn't honour the treaties. So that's what happened on this day in Tudor history, the treaties that led to war. I do hope you enjoy these Tudor events that I bring you. You can subscribe to this channel uh, by clicking round about there. You can uh, hit the bell to be notified as new videos go live. You can also give me a like, leave some feedback, your comments as well. It's great to receive feedback and I do appreciate you following me. I'll be back tomorrow with another On This Day in Tudor History event for you. Take care. Bye-bye.